uh, we have two distinguished guests with us tonight. A timely topic, of course, uh, in the month of November, in particular, about immigration and in particular the state of Arizona. We have here tonight Gabriel Jackson, a scholar of immigration law, criminal procedure, and race and law, and is the Chester H. Smith Professor of Law and Director of the Program in Criminal Law and Policy at the University of Arizona, my alma mater, Bill Katz. Bear down. He has written and lectured extensively about SB 1070, which is the controversial legislation in Arizona where they made it legal for law enforcement to uh, check for papers of anyone in the state uh, based on offenses. His scholarship has appeared in UCLA, Cornell, Iowa, Illinois, and North Carolina Law Reviews, Georgetown Law Journal, and the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review, among many others. He has regularly listed in surveys and is the most highly cited legal scholar. So we welcome Dr. Jackson. <laughs> also with us tonight is Frank Contreras, who is a multimedia content provider of news and analysis from Mexico, originally from Tucson. Go Cats again! <laughs> He's been living and writing from Mexico City and around Latin America since 1996, covering breaking events including Mexico's war against violent drug cartels, immigration from Mexico to the United States, and economic ties with other nations. His stories have been broadcast on Al Jazeera, English Television, BBC World Service Radio, CBS Radio and TV, CBC Radio in Canada, Public Radio International in the United States. And so we also welcome Frank Contreras. And now we'll head to Mr. Contreras. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, really glad to be here with you tonight. Traveled to, um, to be with you from Mexico City. And um, what I think I'd like to do um, with my presentation is to show you the human face of this phenomenon from the Mexican side. Looking at this issue of the Arizona law, this controversial law, um, from the south looking north. What does it look like on the other side of the border? So what I wanted to do tonight um, is share with you a couple of reports that I've done uh, recently uh, looking at this very issue and asking, asking people in remote parts of Mexico, what do you think? What do you, first of all, what do you know about Arizona's law, SB 1070, and what do you think about it? What does it make you feel and think and what are their concerns? So, so we'll show you a bit of that. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, as, I, as you heard, I've been in Mexico covering the country since 1996. A lot of the reports that I've done have to do with immigration, partly because I'm the grandson of Mexican immigrants to the United States. My grandparents, as some of you heard earlier today, came to this country around the time of the Mexican Revolution, and they moved to uh, this part of California, to Los Angeles, and also to Arizona. So, uh, so this is something that's been going on for some, some time now. But if you recall, back in, in the day of the Mexican Revolution, a hundred years ago, by the way, this month, right? November 20th is the 100th year anniversary of the Mexican Revolution. And, and back in that time, there wasn't a lot of immigration from Mexico. We started to see a bit as violence picked up, people were leaving. Um, but it wasn't until really after World War II that you started to see large, large numbers of Mexicans come. In the time that I've been in Mexico, in the first 10 years, we saw somewhere around 400 to 450,000 people per year immigrating without papers, illegally if you want to call it that, undocumented people coming into the United States. Every year, imagine 450,000 people, that's enough to populate small cities, right? Every year, year after year. Um, you know the history, I'm sure, in 1994, there were efforts to seal off the border. One was put together by a Mexican-American border patrol chief in the city of El Paso, Texas, Sylvester Reyes, who eventually went on to become a Republican congressman in his district. But he successfully was able to, to block off part of the border. When you talk to people in El Paso and ask them what was it like back in that time, they'll tell you there were so many immigrants crossing, they would cut through your yard. Sometimes they, one person told me they cut through our house. <laughs> and there was a sense of, like, they're coming, they're coming, we've got to stop them. Something's happened, we've got to stop them. That was the perspective from, from some people in, in El Paso. So, Border Patrol Chief Sylvester Reyes put up an operation there to basically block the line. And what he did was essentially block the routes into El Paso, people coming in from Juarez into El Paso. 
and, and basically forced them to go elsewhere. Over in Tijuana and San Diego, people there looked to Sylvester Reyes as an example and, and realized this is working. We've got to do the same thing because they had a, a very similar problem. You may have heard of, uh, of these light up the border campaigns that took place in the middle 90s, right? You would have vehicles pointing their lights south, lighting up the border. You know, people complaining that the federal government's not doing anything about this. We've got to do something. Sounds very similar to what we hear now, right, in Arizona. So, so Tijuana and on the San Diego border, they created a very similar policy. And what they did was they blocked the border. It was one of the most heavily transited parts of the border, these two areas where Mexicans would come in year after year. And what did that do? Of course, that, that forced people uh, to make a decision. Do we still keep coming? Um, and the economic situation in Mexico just has not been very strong since, uh, since the major peso devaluation that occurred in 1994. It was one of the most powerful blows to an economy that had already been stagnant. So people didn't see it as a choice to stay home. They had to do something to, to change their economic reality. And so they, they decided to continue coming. But what did they have to do? They had to go through the most dangerous parts of the border now, because these other passageways were blocked up. So they had to go through the most, the most dangerous parts, the most deadly parts. Um, and that's the Arizona desert. That's the desert that, that my, parent, my grandparents crossed through back in the day of the Mexican Revolution, almost 100 years ago. Um, and it's the place where even with the current um, security policies designed to try to cap off the border, the construction of border walls, heightened security, a, a politics of, of blending um, uh, security affairs, homeland security with immigration, all of that sort of thing, that still has not been able to completely stop the flow. Even the use of the most high technology available in border wall fencing and this sort of thing has not been able to stop the flow. We're told that this year, even, even though there's a, a very strong economic crisis, I would call it, still here in the United States, and in terms of employment, you hear about this all the time, that's affecting a lot of immigrants. And in any case, you still get at least 150,000 per year at this stage, we're told. So they're still coming in in fairly big numbers. And you still see in Arizona, if you go to the coroner's office, the forensic anthropologists who do the work, they're still finding a good number of bodies on the border there, people who are dying as they try to make their way in, into the United States to try to find work. So, so what I want to try to show you a little bit here is um, what are people's attitudes about, about Arizona's law? What are some of the forces that are driving people north? We know that has to do with poverty. We've all heard that. But I want you to see a little bit of that see what that's like if you haven't been to Mexico. And then and then maybe show another story that, that talks about the kinds of deaths in the desert that have been occurring in Arizona. So I'm going to go over to the video, okay? Let's see how this works for us. So now, when I heard that I was going to have this fantastic opportunity to be with you here, thanks to my sister and to folks here at, at Oxy, um, I said to Al Jazeera, you know, we should actually do a report. We should actually um, go to some remote village in Mexico and ask them, um, what do you think about this Arizona law? You know, what is your opinion? What have you heard? Uh, what are your concerns? These kinds of things. And, and Al Jazeera said, all right, do it. So we went in a, in a, in a crew of three as we traveled um, to a place called Tonatico outside of Mexico City. It's, it's in um, the state of Mexico, one of the most heavily populated states in, in Mexico. And it's a, it's a beautiful little colonial town. There are, um, uh, they call them aguas termales. That is um, hot springs welling up from the earth there. You can, you can go there on the weekend. It's really lovely. But generally, the town's empty. Because for decades now, it's been sending immigrants to um, Waukegan, Illinois. <laughs> not just to yeah, not just to the United States, but specifically and probably specific neighborhoods as well.